Hey guys, StarCraft here, and well, you guys wanted and Frank Miller, I'm happy to oblige. I love Frank Miller's work. Even when the man went a little nuts though, I still love his work. Unlike a certain hat wearing guy with glasses out there on, on the internet, hey, Linkara, I'm never gonna see my stuff. I doubt he ever is, but I still care, you know, like the guy, watch the guy's stuff. But I still highly disagree with him on so much of Frank's stuff, even though Frank's insane. A lot of times, at least his, in, a few years ago, lately seems to have mellowed out. Thank God. Uh, the man has still done great work. So, that's what I'm going to be talking about here. Unfortunately, i got to make this clear, except for one... Sorry. With one exception, I don't own any of his Marvel work. Sorry, so no Daredevil, except for one exception. No Elektra, again, one exception. No, none of that. I'm sorry, guys. I don't have any. I'm trying to get enough to get those omnibuses. Maybe if I reach a thousand, I get monetized. I can start getting super chats on um, on my streams. Get people to start subscribing, maybe, and I'll st I can do a follow up. But well, what's that one exception in this particular What If collection, which collected What If 200? It does include the What If Electra had lived, which basically says that. What if when Bullseye was escaping, he got sniped, and then that basically led to um, them getting away, and then basically the two, you know, he, she and, um, and Matt both run off and be alone together. And there's a moment in here that actually gets referenced later at another um, what if, the what if Civil War, where the Watcher comes to a person at the grave. In the Civil War case, it's Tony against it's Cap's grave. In this case, it's Matt with Electra, and they show him what could have been and Frank wrote and drew that one and it's a beautiful one but unfortunately like I said it's the only Marvel book I've got of Derek um, Frank of uh, Frankie boy but I do have plenty of his DC work uh, for example Ronin this was would, would have been vertical vertical existed back then but this I later find out there's so much of Samurai Jack in this except in the case of Samurai Jack Spoiler, although this is a really old book. Samurai Jack, all the stuff is real. In this case, it's revealed not to be, but it's his artwork in this case is, it's his roughy, rough, sketchy art style, but it's still damn good in its imaginative ways. I'm not sure if, um, Klaus Jansen did the inking on this. Uh, nope, no Klaus Jansen. This was by the time after Dark Knight Returns. I'll get, I'll get to that one where he basically was moved, transitioning away from needing Klaus's help. Big mistake if you ask me. And I would definitely get into why, but in this case, the rest of his artwork is still really good, really interesting, but at the same time, it's still clean. It's not the uber scratchiness most of the time. I mean, there's times where it is. And the funny thing is that this issue and this whole series ends on, well, for such as as one of his stronger female characters. Yeah. Big shock! An actual strong female character that's not a slut, not a whore. And the, by the end of it all, it ends with this really long splash. Hold on. Ah. That all of it. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> wow, right? Just for a big, huge explosion. Man, how, it, how this was back in the 80s when this came out. And this is one of the books that got him to be at DC for a while. And then, of course, the other one was Dark Knight Returns. This, okay, let's get into talking about Dark Knight Returns for quite a bit. This changed so much about Batman. Okay, but by this time, he was already starting to become the Dark Knight from the 70s. People sometimes want to contribute this to it or Killing Joke. No, he was already on his way there. But Frank here... He helped redefine Batman for a more mainstream audience who are still thinking of, oh, it's, um, oh, you're talking about Burt Ward, Adam West, Bip Bam Pal, because the 70s redefined it for the comic book fans who were buying the books. This, however, redefined it for comic book and people who were mainstream who just thought all the other stuff. And what can I say? He started introducing stuff in here that this, and another book I'll be getting to, obviously, that would define so much of Batman. But at the same time, though, how he would handle Batman in the future 
kind of is hinted off in here and it makes a bit more sense what he would later do. I, I don't have All-Star Batman and Robin on me. I don't. I've read through them before through other means, but I don't own them. But when I did read through them, at first I was put off, but by the time we were reaching the end of it, I started to sit and to realize, wait, there's actually a story to this that he's doing that Batman was crazy, hinted at a little bit here, and that basically Bruce, and you know, well, Bruce was not even part of the picture until Robin, until he realized what he was doing to the kid, that he realized that, oh, well, look what I'm doing. I had all these years, and yet I'm forcing this kid into all this. Of course, he's going to be more crazy, because I had time to hone my skills. I'm just tossing him into the deep end, and yeah, he's swimming, but not in the right way. So, I just want to get that out of the way, that there actually is a bit of a a bit of a reason behind everything when you really think I didn't get beyond the I'm the goddamn Batman and all that. You get past that. Again, it's not great, I'll be honest, and you should be more in for Jim Lee's artwork. But deep down, I think Frank did have an, a plan. He just didn't get there. He didn't tell it right. He did it with Joe Byrne his crazy time. And yeah, I think that's what happened. There is something that we can see it connect into here. Also making Wonder Woman more of a bitch as she is. I get what he's going for. There. I'll get to that in a little bit. But again, just so much of this. And it puts Batman in a prime element of Gotham has gone crime rated again. They need the bat again. He needs to come back. Two-Face, something that Jeff Blow up would kind of take in reverse in Batman Hush, where Two-Face is, you know, Harvey seems to be healed, but he's not. In that case... Two-Face took completely took over. He may look like Harvey, but he's not Harvey. And I like that. I don't think anyone ever thought about that. Of, there's always a good chance of the evil side fully taking over. Now in the case of Jeff Loeb, it was the opposite. Harvey did take over and it matched the face. But in this case, nope. He looks like Harvey, but it was Two-Face entirely. Just putting on an act of Harvey. Because he knew Harvey well enough. Then, his Joker. Good lord, his Joker. I think this is really more so than even the um, 70s, you know, the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill version. Really gave us a sociopathic Joker. A Joker who just didn't care. A Joker that just, you know, he did the stuff because, yeah, he had a connection with Batman. Not to the degree that Scott Snyder would take it. But he at the same time still felt like, yeah. I mean, and in the animated movie, I love the animated movie. They got the guy who played Ben from Lost, I believe. Oh, that voice of his. It just works so well. Especially when he's like, Are you out of your mind? Or when he actually said, And I love you for it. You're just like, Okay, maybe there's a little bit of what Scott Snyder saw in there. But I don't think Frank was intending it to be that, that strong. But at the same time, he's just like, You didn't have the guts. And they'll never know. And that's the other thing I like is, Gordon... Because he's getting to that age, he's forced to retire. And he does. And when you do, you have a new young upstart. Um, um, oh, jeez, what was her name? Um, a Yindal. Yindal, who comes in and basically, like, she's like how Gordon, as Batman himself went out. She's like Gordon in the old days. Actually being able to be quick, catch up, and she doesn't have a liking for Batman at all. In fact, I do like there's one scene where... Um, Gordon is trying to explain it to her. He's trying to explain, and he uses FDR, what happened after Pearl Harbor, how basically up at that point, everyone was afraid. Everyone kept thinking, oh no, wait, wait, oh, did we just loot it? And they, they thought, some people thought they lost the entire East Coast. They didn't know it was just Hawaii. They said it was more than that. But what did FDR do? He got on, he spoke to everyone, and everyone calmed down. And he compares Batman to something similar. People who are more like a freak out ever nothing ends up becoming you know he ends up being as Gordon put it he's too big he's an ideal he can't stop an ideal and then afterwards after sorry about that sorry about that phone call but anyways I was as I was saying um when a nuke goes off causing an EMP that turns that turns off all the power in the city and basically causes everyone to break out and loot and everything and bam is able to gather up a former gang of the mutants yeah that were dealt with earlier and once they were dealt with um basically then 
Yindel looks at him and realizes that he's the one who's calmed everything down. He realizes what Gordon was saying. He's too big. And that's the point when Yindel's part of the story is done. But by this point, especially after this, where the government, this is during the Reagan era, is feeling like, yeah, he made us look bad after everything that happened. Gotham is the only city that's actually still under control, whereas we're still trying to figure everything else out. He's making us look bad. And Superman, who by this was introduced, and he is a bit of a government whip, you know, lackey. Superman and comes in and goes in the two fight. Now, Frank has recently, I don't know where he stood before him, but he's recently been more saying how the whole reason he did all this was Superman's the ultimate challenge. Which, when you think about it, he is. He is the ultimate challenge of what do, and how do you stop the strongest man in the world? And... Yeah, see the government lackey. It worked for the story, but again, I really don't think Frank was intending on this to get as bad. And you know, the people feel like, oh, Superman's a wussy. Ugh. And when you really look at this one during this point when he's fighting Batman and Superman and Batman's fighting him, and Batman says, "I want you to remember the man who beat you." He still didn't win. He still lost. He just started beating the shit out of him, but he didn't stop it. Basically, showing that. I'm the one that brought you down to your lowest. Which, okay, that's one thing, but I think that's how one should really look at it as. Is that he's the one who brought Batman down to his, Superman down to his lowest before he fakes his death. And then later, Batman's revealed to be fine, and he's off with the Bat Boys. And um, Carrie, oh, Carrie Kelly, I completely overshadowed her. She's a great creation and another strong female character who the kids, so people would say, oh, we didn't have time to make her a slut. No. But she's a great strong character. A great Robin. There's a reason why some people wanted her to exist. And even though Peter Tomasi tried to, that fell to her on the way, by the wayside. She's still a great strong character. She's still a kid who's like, he's, she's in it because Batman saved her. She wants to help. And she's a good soldier. That's one thing that Batman keeps saying, calling her. Good soldier. Good soldier. And yeah. Even when he says like, what's your name? Carrie Kelly. What's your real name? Robin. Tells you right there. She's already ready to dedicate herself as Robin to the cause. Why? Because he inspired her. And she does a great job. Even when she's in over her head or she freaks out or a guy or a guy who's trying to kill her gets killed himself just by a fluke. She eventually snaps out of it, comes in help, and she's there with Batman and the Bat Boys trying to, you know, um, rebuild, redo, drop the Batman moniker for a while. And he basically decides, and it's a good life, good enough. Which, again, even Alan Moore for a while, when he was getting into doing Twilight of the Superheroes, he felt like this was a great cap off for Batman. And that's what he was trying to do with Twilight of the Superheroes. And, yeah, that was this particular story. But, um, then you get into his follow-up. Before we get into Batman Year One, Let's talk about Dark Knight Strikes again. First of all, the artwork here. It goes from tolerable to flat out what the fuckery. I mean, it's like, what what the hell happened, Frank? But this is the point where, I think Carr put it best. He started working on Sin City, and he just never stopped. The scene is at that point where, and even Neil Adams told him this at one point, when they, during the last time they, those two interacted was, he felt like, you don't, you shouldn't let everyone, everything everyone says to you, get to you. You shouldn't believe the hype. You shouldn't believe, in this case, that he's the greatest creator. And he did. When you look at it that way, he did. Frank just kept thinking, like, I'm the greatest. I know everything. And this is the point when he started having, like, Superman and Wonder Woman, who he always paired those two up. He's like, why would he want someone like Lois and Wonder Woman? And why would he want Lois Lane when he could have Wonder Woman, someone who could take him? Which... Okay, I get where he's going at. I do get it. But at the same time, it's like, Frank, you don't... <sighs> you don't understand, Frank. But throughout all this, look, I get the story of Dark Knight Strikes Again. He's taking everything, he's working with the DC Universe, and he's just expanding everything, take, making it broader, and, you know, he's just trying to tell a bit different story. His characterizations are off. Like Lex, why is he a little troll guy? Why is Brainiac caring about money and all of that? I mean, I get it. the Lex Luthor Brainiac team up. That I get. Candor being involved, 
I get. It. And that's why Superman's more of a whipping boy. Again, I get it. And I didn't mind Supergirl and Wonder and Superman's and Wonder Woman's woman's daughter, uh, who is the Supergirl in this story. She seems, especially by the time we get to a later story, she had potential. She was a bit of an ass, and that gets played out later on. But for what it was, she wasn't that bad. Although I will agree, the whole Dick Grayson being crazy psychotic, although given what we see in Dark Knight All-Star Batman, yeah, I understand. And the other thing that happened in Dark Knight Returns was Jason Todd was dead. And later on we find out during another story, again, I'll get to, why he was a good soldier and better than Dick. And Dick is here and Batman said, you can cut the mustard. I think they'll bet more Batman being like, yeah. I, I think that's more Batman Boris condemning himself for training him wrong, but he's like, you did this, you went this far, you don't earn any sympathy from me. Again, if you really stop to think about it, I can understand where probably Frank is coming from. That didn't make excuse for the bad writing or artwork, but at the same time, it's still, you can start to get, if you really think about it, you can understand it. Sticking with Batman, there's also Batman Spawn. Nice little stories, more in canon with Spawn and anything. Tom McFarlane artwork, great stuff, and yeah, it's a fun little story. And heck, it actually has Batman throwing a batarang in Spawn's face, which actually then connects into later stuff where he has shoelaces to patch it all up because this was still canon. It's pretty fun. It's in the Dark Knight Returns universe. What more can you say? Then you have one of the big ones. Batman Year One, where he redefined Batman's origin completely. That lasted all the way up until Zero Year. And I mean, even Scott Snyder didn't feel worthy about it, but <sighs> what can I say? You just have great moments like this where you're introducing the mob, the mafia. We wouldn't even have had Batman Long Halloween if it wasn't for this. And it's just like asking the big questions like, what if, and what, how was Gotham like before the super criminals when Batman first showed up? He'd be taking out the mobs, the criminals. There were no super, you know, super criminals yet. It was just the mob. But the best part is, Batman is a side character throughout all this. It's all about Batman's origin, yes, it's first year, but most of it's through the eyes of Jim's of James Gordon, who Frank redid. By this point, Gordon was just a character. He didn't really matter much. But Frank made him both in Dark Knight Returns and in year one made him a badass. He actually made him a character more worthy of being with working with Batman as a partner. He made him Green Beret. He made him all this stuff to make him a hardcore person. Basically the person who, if Batman wasn't there, Gordon would have tried to clean up Gotham. Would he have succeeded? I don't know. Would he have been able to stop the super criminals if, when and if they showed up? Maybe. I mean, that's what Gotham, the show is kind of showing. But that's where people started thinking about Gotham and Gordon more as the ass kicker. And it worked. The only problem he did but for some reason he had he named his wife Barbara, and I think Frank's opening admitted he got that mixed up. Look, well, hey, nobody's perfect, right? Then you get into some of his dark horse work with, for example, Marsha Washington. With Dave Gibbons, this is a great political satire that, funny enough, this is more relevant now than ever. I'm not kidding. I am not kidding at all. This is more relevant than ever before, especially when you have this big civil war that happens. Basically, they have to be like a uber conservative, gains a lot of power, and it's not exactly like today, but in this case, it's like an uber conservative, creates himself a lot of power, but then after an incident happens, after an accident, where and you know, an accident leads to an intentional assassination attempt that eventually leads to all and him being out, you know, in a coma, and a um, all of his cabin and everyone, vice president, and all that are dead, except for one person, the head of agriculture, who is, uh, you know, a um, a liberal, and he starts using all that power given to start fixing everything, but ends up causing things to get worse and worse. Trying to fix it, he really thinks he's doing the right thing, but then you have this one power mad guy who then decides I'm going to cause a coup, but then you find out this guy, this. We need of a, um, of a new president trying to keep things all held together. He was actually doing a better job than people thought. Because after he's dead, it goes to hell and becomes a civil war. You have these, like the, um, hold on. 
what do they call themselves? The, um, because they actually have a whole map that separates everything. Where is it? Oh, where is it? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this, people. Oh, come on. Oh, well, who cares? But still, though, it, and it starts off with that, and then it goes further and further with some of the other, you know, things that have changed, how things have changed, how people are, uh, and like in this war, it doesn't end for a long time, a very long time. And he has, like, shout-outs to a Jack Kirby-like character. You have so many other things that happen throughout all of this. And basically, Martha is one of Frank's strongest characters. Really is. And by the end of all, she does die and another war started up and it leaves that going. But basically, it's... She changes... The, Martha changes the world because she just holds on to her beliefs. And again, Dave Gibbons' artwork... Oh, it's amazing. It's fantastic. Then, you have RoboCop vs. Terminator. I love RoboCop vs. I love the games. Never bought them, but I rented them back in the day. This is the hardcover edition that's the recoloring. Very good stuff. No John Connor, no Sarah Connor. There's just RoboCop, Terminators, and Skynet. John Connor is there, kind of, but only in the future sense. And even then, it never meets. And basically, it, it, it's a big action fest. It's own self-contained thing. Plays off the notion of Skynet being a full-on technology and all that. And by the end of it all, I mean, it plays up with stuff that Frank originally was going to do for Ro his scripts for Robocop uh, 2 and 3. I'll get to that. You know, like, for example, he's basically like a, mecha a mecha machine god because he's a, a person, a being that has a foot in both cybernetic and humanity. You know, things like that. And we actually see what Skynet would have done like if they had won. And they, they win in a possibility. He would have got they would have gone into space and tried to bring perfection to the rest of the universe. Wow, that's you actually when you think about that, it's it's scary actually. Yeah, if you if you think about that. That that was what could have happened. And it makes sense. Why would Skynet just stop on Earth? No, they want to go out and try to bring it. Then you have the adaptations of his scripts for Robocop 2 and 3. Now, to be fair, his script for Robocop 3 was written as a sequel to the movie of 2. That's why a character who's in, it's in both of these, even though she dies in the second one. But this one, you can see other, 2 definitely felt a bit closer to his script, except just felt more trying to keep the budget restrained. So, 2 does not change that much. Although, it does, a scene that's in the third movie is... Guy runs into a donut shop, ready to, you know, with a gun, and all the cops are there. Although it doesn't have the, tell me, what's it like to be a rocket scientist? Instead of that, it's just, um, it's Nancy walks up saying, police, donuts. It's a law of nature. <laughs> she decks the guy. And, yeah, though, it feels a bit more bombastic. It, there's no way this would have been budgeted right. There's no way. But then, you get the Robocop 3. One, it does feel like he wrote this with a small budget in mind. But the other thing I do like about it is, Nancy would probably, the actor, um, I forget the actress's name, the actress who played Nancy, she has a lot less screen time than she did in the in the actual theatrical movie, but it actually has a bigger impact. Because in that movie, she goes out without a bulletproof threat that she wore in the first two movies. She just goes out there so that she could get shot and get killed halfway through. In this case, She's killed off in between, but we get a flashback there where we see a more high power rep rifle go right through her bulletproof armor. And she's basically telling them, never stop making them pay. Get them for me, Murphy, before she dies. And basically, this has been haunting Murphy ever since. Then we bring, basically, and this is really about the fall of, um, of, um, of the people who made Robocop. Um, ODC, I believe, or whatever, and... And, and suppose that I'm getting bought out in between movies. Instead, they basically have it be that this is a case where, oh no, it's going to, uh, like, it's, they're making a last ditch effort. Uh, OCP, sorry. OCP is their last ditch effort. They, and basically, it still keeps a lot of the stuff. It plays off more from the ending of the second theatrical movie. 
but this would have been a grand finale. For one, you brought in a woman who actually brings up the whole notion of you're more than that. And it shows that Robocop, he's falling apart since he hasn't had anyone to keep him maintenance. And the other thing I like though is, you remember the jetpack? Remember how stupid that was? You're not gonna believe how they do that here. Instead of a jetpack, hold on. He's an angel of death of machinery. Yeah. That would have been so much more awesome. Granted, that was something the comic artists came up with instead. The artwork on, the, on both of these are different, obviously, but they're still very interesting. And this, it brings finality. It brings a complete finality to Robocop, more so than the third movie actually did. And it feels like it tells a complete story that Frank had in mind. It, I wish they made that instead. Now let's get into the other thing he really is known for. Sin City. This is the only one I've got. I got it with the movie. So actually I could sit both of them. I could definitely say I never read them, but I have watched them. And so given how Robert Rodriguez brought Frank on and they basically flat out adapted these things, I I get him. You know, I like him. The very no pulp noir stuff, it's good. It's damn good. And what can I say? It's just the movies and this. They tell very intriguing stories about very, they're all almost, all, there's almost no good, pure good people. Even the best people have some not so goodness to them. But in the end, you're just seeing the life of these people in a place called Sin City. What do you expect it to them to be like? And yeah, Chuck Frank actually had a good knack for directing. Although when he did this, I actually don't hate this. I mean, I don't hate this movie. And, and I, I don't love it. I don't hate it. I think it's just dumb fun. And it was a disgrace to um, Will Eisner's memory. I don't think so. I don't go that far. I don't think it's a complete disservice to Will Eisner. I think it's just its own thing. And Frank was having fun. He probably needed someone else to keep an eye on him. I think he was given way too much freedom. But for what it was... It was a dumb, fun movie that you get to see as an alternate interpretation. Is it a definitive interpretation? Hell no! But it is an interpretation. It's not so far out that it's practically in name only. It's just Frank's interpretation. This is what Frank probably would have written if he, and drawn if he made this a comic. Would Will appreciate it? I don't know. Probably not. But I don't think he would have hated it. He would have been like, hey, you did your own thing. Then... Holy terror. I'm not going to go much further about this. It is what it is. Even Frank admits he can never remake this again, thankfully. Would this have worked as the Batman uh, story was meant to be? No. I. There's some good artwork. Like when he does the smudges to make the smog and all that. And, you know, if that's damn good. But I don't want to show much more of this. It's, I'm, not bad, I'm not upset I bought it, although I wish I got it at a cheaper price. But, for what it is, it's mediocre. I do not have 300 or Zerus Zer or whatever that recent book is. But what I do have, The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Returns, Last Crusade, and The Dark Knight's Remaster Race. The last stuff I'll be talking about. And this, this actually puts focus on what happened before Dark Knight Returns with Jason. And you see that? Yeah. Jason was treated different than Robin. By this point, Bruce has gotten older. He's mellowed out more, a lot more. He's working closer to how he was in Dark Knight Returns. He's not crazy. And basically, the Batman side of him is more gun dormant. Joker is still just a sociopathic, even more so, I think. And Jason, he's too much like Bruce in his youth. And Batman doesn't like that. He's like, no, he's not ready. He's not ready. And at the very end, we don't see how Jason dies, but we know what's going to happen as... He goes in to find the Joker, and he gets taken out by the Joker's goons. Again, uh, we'll never know how it happens, but it's pretty terrifying. But it just actually fills in so much. Again, it shows why Jason felt better than, Bam than, than, J than Dick. Mostly because it was all Bruce's fault, of course. Then, Dark Knight Street of Master Race. Again, I didn't hate this. It feels like a return to form, although... How much of this is Brian Azzarello and how much of this is um, is Frank? I don't know. Frank has even said this is not the story he would have done. So maybe take that for what it's will, which what, what you will. But 
for what it is, like Andy Kubert's artwork in this is damn good. And the characterizations are straightened out. I mean, Wonder Woman feels a bit more acceptable as a character. You actually believe the romance with her and Superman. Superman, I'll get to him in a moment. Supergirl actually goes through a character arc and gets fixed, you know, you know straightened out. The Master Race, I knew it was going to be the Kandorians. I knew it. that's what it was. Because you was like, the Master Race, oh, Kandorians, of course. You still have that Bottle City to play with. Then you have, um, you still keep Flash going on and Adam. They're still relevant. And um, you have um, Carrie Kelly actually starts to become, instead of Cat Girl, like she was in that one. In this case, she actually steps up and eventually becomes Batgirl and then Batwoman. By the end of it all. And it's... I mean, I just love that. Although, if there's one thing I didn't like... Well, actually, the other thing I also liked is... He reigns in what he did with Hal. He made Hal pretty much a god in in, in that story. In this case, he brings it in and he's like... No, no, let's take that back a bit. But, um... One thing I didn't like is they basically... I don't know if they killed her off. But they basically implied that they killed off Yindel... At the very end, although she's still narrating, so I can't tell if she's dead or not, but they did. That's a crying shame, because she actually comes again full circle back to this in this point. And she's right. But again, the narration leaves it up in the air. But then Superman, in this, especially in this, they fix him so much. Now, they also DH um, Bruce, put him in a Lazarus pin so he's healed and young again. Probably in case they want to tell more stories. I get it, but uh, that just. Again, it doesn't feel right, although the way he died would not have been great either where they ha where it happened at, but yeah, but Superman, he fixes Superman. He makes Superman basically be, um, he finally gets straightened out. First, he was frozen in ice, then he fights the Kandori, then they put him in this black substance that makes him feel like for him, thousands of years had passed, but it gave him enough time to think. And straighten out his his thoughts together for the first time in who knows how long. And we start to see a Superman that's how he should be. I mean, I love especially, you know, how he says to him. Like, because he's, you know, he basically, um, I'm not going to let you die after I brought you back to life, Bruce. You shouldn't have done that. No? So sue me. You have the money to burn. Hire the best attorneys. It won't matter. See, the people all agree with me. The world needs a Batman. And then he walks up. He first gets beaten down a bit. But then... Oh, jeez. He then starts tearing into them. And I love this from Batman. Dear God. That son of a bitch. He's been holding back all these years. He moves. He's already striking with and when he's avoiding a punch. To a certain geometry. The physical violence. I like to think that I've mastered it. And it turns out I'm still a student. That and they, they might be faster, stronger, younger, but they're not smarter than him. Wow. That's basically Bruce admitting Clark's been better. I'm nothing compared to him. I mean, yeah. It is so damn good. And by the end of it all, he's ready to show um, his, his daughter how to be human. He's stepping back from being Superman, maybe for good. And giving her an identity and showing her, you need to remember to be human again. And by the end of it all, you have, um, you got Superman. He's done. For right now, anyway. And Batman and Carrie are ready to go out. I'm glad they don't hint any, oh, I love this bit. <laughs> no, they don't have any romance or whatever. It's more like a, she's like more of the daughter that's grown up finally for him. And while he's DH, he's not thinking of her in that way. Thank God. And yeah, it ends with the world in a much better place, even better than it was at the end of Dark Knight Strikes Again. It could end there. You could see more stories happening. Frank could tell his story and he's working on Superman year one. I'm actually one of those who's actually looking forward to that. I want to see how they do that. And that's Frank. Bit of a roller coaster of a career. It has his great writing moment. Then it went through that whole period of him where he was getting more insane. And like I said, he was just starting to believe his, the old, all the crap, all the bullshit, all the high praise he was basically hearing from everyone. And these past couple of years, he's mellowed out quite a bit. If you look at how he's been acting lately when he does interviews. 
Although I'm not sure if he's in the best of health. Maybe Dad might have done anything. When you ever look at him, he doesn't look so well. But other than that, though, yeah, I love Frank's artwork. I'm still and his, all of his work. I'm still gonna love his work. I'd love to still meet the man one day. It's probably never gonna happen, but I would love to meet him one day. And yeah, that's Frank. That's all I gotta say, in Frank. At some, uh, some point, either before today, no, later today, I'll be posting up my opinion on Graveyard Shift. Yep, got mine in just today. I can't wait to read it. I haven't yet because I was focused on this. And then, what's next? I don't know. I really don't know who's winning the poll right now. Doesn't look like there's a clear-cut winner for once. So until then, I'll catch you all later.